from Florence, Italy. The city of inspiration for sculptors in ages past and for centuries to come. You're listening to The Sculptor's Funeral. Good day to you all and welcome again to The Sculptor's Funeral, the podcast for figurative sculptors around the world. I am your host, Jason Arkles, a sculptor and educator living and working in Florence, Italy, that fantastic city where all the great sculptors are dead. And I don't feel so well myself. And today, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Thus reads the sonnet by Emma Lazarus, inscribed on the base of the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor, as I mentioned in the last podcast. Now let's go back in time and imagine ourselves in the mid to late 19th century, if we can, a time when the United States embraced the arrival of immigrants to come live, work, and make a better life for themselves. Times then, of course, were much different than in our own day. Back then, in the 19th century, the global phenomenon known as the Industrial Revolution was just ramping up. In America, factories needed workers, farmers needed farmhands to raise the food to feed the workers in the factories. The nation's very infrastructure needed to expand at a tremendous rate to keep up with this influx of newly minted Americans, which fed the growth of the nation, a march of progress which in the late 19th century seemed more like a sprint. America itself was physically expanding, swallowing up Native American territories by hook or by crook, mostly by crook, and it seemed as though the U.S. would just never run out of land, resources, and God's grace. So, of course, at that time, it welcomed immigrants. The U.S. needed railroads built, forests cut, rivers dammed, coal mined, steel forged, and crops harvested. Plenty of room for everyone. However, nothing can grow at such a rate without suffering growing pains. While there was an abundance of land and therefore, theoretically, plenty of room for the influx of immigrants to the United States, the immigrants settled where there were jobs to be had. And that, of course, would be in the cities. New York, Boston, Washington, D.C., Detroit, Chicago, St. Louis, and Cincinnati were destinations of choice for the new arrivals, as these cities were the 19th century powerhouses of industry and commerce. The multitude of iron workers and seamstresses all needed a place to live, and the short-term solution in the 19th century was to house as many people as possible in the smallest space as possible in what were called tenements. Now, tenements were basically what we now call apartment buildings, but in the 19th century, in places like New York and Washington, D.C., they could be absolutely hellish, with no running water or natural light or sufficient air, which quite naturally became breeding grounds of crime and disease. If you want more specific information about the conditions of the working poor in large cities during this time, I recommend reading the book by Jacob Rees entitled How the Other Half Lives, written in 1890, which documented firsthand the horrors of the tenement slum. And also, from, from what I've read, the movie uh, Gangs of New York does a pretty good job of depicting some of the worst tenements in the 19th century New York as well. And the movie was based off of a book written in 1920 of the same name. Tenement slums could occupy significant areas of an industrialized city. Manhattan's Lower East Side was a pretty famous example of that. Usually, slums would gradually eat up the center of a city, as those who could afford it would move out to the periphery. The centers of cities were to be avoided by the middle and upper classes, who would venture in on business during the day if they had to, but even businesses started to move out of the centers, leaving the core of the largest cities and their destitute residents to rot. America's cities had a real problem. And the solution to dealing with this throng of immigrants in the 19th century was to build a wall. Not really, of course. That would be ridiculous. Now, instead, progressive efforts at reform were put in place to deal with, accommodate, and improve the lives of all who lived in the cities of America, rich and poor, immigrant and native-born. Laws were passed which made the slumlords more responsible for these dwellings and for the people who lived therein. Infrastructure like roads and public transportation were improved. Dangerous buildings were torn down and newer, safer buildings put in their place. Other reform movements throughout the 19th century, such as the Women's Rights Movement, 
the labor movement and the rise of labor unions, the educational reform movement, and many, many others each did their part to raise the standard of living for everyone in the nation's cities. Now, reform took decades and decades. It was, it was far from perfect and far from complete, and the inner cities of the United States still suffer. But over time, conditions have improved. There was no decisive knockout blow to the 19th century squalor of the inner cities. Rather, it gradually diminished as the multitude of social movements and social reformers chipped away at the problem and, in fact, continued to do so. It seems as though everyone had their part to play in the emergence of the modern American city. And American artists and architects were no exception. For reform-minded city planners and architects, their part to play seemed fairly straightforward. Tenement slums were poorly built, shabby, and bred crimes and disease. They were the home of thieves and scoundrels of every sort. And what's more, they were ugly. They were a physical manifestation of hopelessness. How could anyone living in such a miserable place be inspired to improve oneself? How could anyone take pride in where they lived, not just in the tenement itself, but in a city which could not offer them even the lowest standard of safety and security? Why wouldn't a person turn to a life of crime? Living in a place which showed a patent disrespect for its inhabitants, why should the inhabitants have any respect for anyone else or for themselves? And this was the thinking of reform-minded architects. You improve the place where a person lived, build a structure, a neighborhood, a city which instilled pride and respect, institute an architecture that reflects moral order and civic pride, as the old European cities had once done, and the minds and the morality of its inhabitants, if maybe not their fortunes, would follow. This attitude and outlook on the moralizing effects of the beautification of civic spaces and the efforts this attitude engendered was known as the City Beautiful Movement, and that is the subject of today's podcast. Now, right at the outset, I want to again mention that the City Beautiful movement was just one aspect of a larger reform movement happening in all areas of society. The City Beautiful movement's aims were limited to what the name implies, the aesthetics of a city and its public spaces. It had little to do with sanitation or access to clean water or fresh air or natural light or anything else directly affecting the standard of living in tenement slums. These issues were addressed by other progressives who operated in adjacent political spheres who could pass the building codes which improved that situation. A reform-minded architect could easily design safer and cleaner and more healthy spaces, but the real power was in the hands of the owners of the properties who hired those architects. The newer, cleaner, healthier designs were usually more expensive, so owners simply would go with the cheapest design the law would allow. So unless building codes and the enforcement of these codes was strengthened, forcing the owners to go with the safer designs, there was little an architect could really do beyond advocating for reform. Sometimes the City Beautiful movement is misunderstood as a naive effort on the part of elitist architects who thought that slapping a little Beaux-Arts architecture on the facade of a building would transform the teeming masses into respectable citizens. It wasn't that. The progressive reform movement in the late 19th century in America was far-reaching and inspired people, again, in all walks of life. The City Beautiful movement was simply the way architects and artists found a way to take part in that movement. The very fact that today the City Beautiful movement is often singled out from other aspects of reform at the time, either critically or laudably, is in fact a testament to its effectiveness and long-lasting influence. Millions of people every day continue to enjoy the lasting benefits born out of the City Beautiful movement, without which Central Park in Manhattan and the National Mall in Washington, D.C. would be very different places. However, for all the lasting good that came out of the 19th century civic reforms, it's also important to understand that it wasn't purely an altruistic act on the part of the wealthy on behalf of the urban poor. Crime and disease may start in unhealthy and crowded slums, but it will affect the population of the entire city. It was apparent that improving the lives of the poor would raise the standard of living for everyone. So, 
The City Beautiful movement wasn't a concept thought up at a dinner party or in a town hall by a single person or by a group of architects. The notion of the beautification of America's cities and the deliberate planning of public spaces to reflect order, harmony, and promotion of civic loyalty was a spontaneous reaction by architects and city planners nationwide. And this reaction was to an extraordinary event which occurred in the summer of 1893. That event was the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition, commonly referred to as the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. We can't really understand the City Beautiful movement without a good idea of what the Chicago World's Fair was all about, and what world fairs in general were all about. And so, let's take some time to learn about this fantastic, fantastic event. So, what was a World's Fair? We know what a regular fair is like, such as a county fair or a state fair. It's a gathering, usually annually, to show off a particular locale's commerce and culture. You eat the local food, check out the prize livestock if you're into that sort of thing. You have a little fun on the rides and the games and other diversions on offer at the county fair. A world's fair was all that and much more, and on a global scale. Nations who participated in world's fairs used the opportunity to showcase everything a country had to offer, from its agriculture to industry to its art and its culture. It's where nations could advertise and brand themselves to other nations and their populations. It's where fantastic achievements and inventions could be debuted to the world in an era before mass communication. Inventions like the phonograph and the telephone, they made their debut at world's fairs, for example. Ideas could be exchanged, foreign cultures could be discovered and experienced, business deals across continents could be orchestrated. State-of-the-art advances in science, medicine, art, every area of human endeavor were all on display for the price of an admission ticket. If you've ever been to an industrial trade show like, like the Detroit Auto Show, or to a convention like Comic-Con, or to a musical festival like Glastonbury, well, then you've seen a tiny, tiny fraction of what you could have seen at a World's Fair in the 19th century. Imagine Comic-Con, the Detroit Auto Show, Glastonbury, and a hundred other events all happening at the same time and in the same place, and you start to get the picture. Or you could think of the World's Fair as the 19th century version of the Internet, in terms of how it could disseminate ideas and share information to anyone with access. It could be argued that world's fairs were the first global networks. In the early part of the 19th century, France and other European nations had held national expositions, usually focused on industry, but it wasn't until 1851 in London that an international exposition was held known as the Great Exhibition of the Works of Industry of All Nations, or more simply as the Great Exhibition. It was held in Hyde Park in a temporary structure called the Crystal Palace, and sometimes this World's Fair is known as the Crystal Palace Exhibition. It was largely the idea of Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria, who saw it as a way to directly compete with, and of course triumph over, the industries of other nations, particularly over the industry of France. To some extent, the exhibition was used to signal to other nations that Britain remained strong the exhibition coming as it did after a few decades of social upheaval in Britain. Several advancements in science and industry debuted there, including the daguerreotypes of Matthew Brady, the world's first voting machine, the first public toilets, not just temporary latrines, but public toilets that flushed. It was also the occasion which sparked a yachting race between nations, known then and now as America's Cup. The Great Exhibition had an attendance equal to a third of Britain's population, and it turned a very healthy profit. The money raised by the exhibition went on to fund the founding of what are now the Victoria and Albert Museum, as well as the Science Museum and the Natural History Museum in London. It also went on to fund a trust which provides industrial grants, which continues to this day. So here, in the first World's Fair, the Crystal Palace Exhibition, we have elements which would be common to all World's Fairs that followed a fostering of nationalism and national pride, the unveiling of the latest technologies, the display of noteworthy architecture used as the centerpiece for the fair, the founding of institutions which long outlived the fair itself, 
enormous crowds attracting visitors from all around the world, and the fair itself being seen as a profit venture, although subsequent fairs lost money more often than they turned a profit. The success of the London Great Exhibition was soon followed by other world's fairs, usually held in countries who, like Britain, saw the fair as an opportunity to strengthen the national brand. Thus, we get the 1876 World's Fair, called the Centennial Exposition, in Philadelphia, which celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, and the 1889 Paris World's Fair, marking the 100th anniversary of the French Revolution. The New York Fair in 1853, the first fair which followed the Crystal Palace Exhibition, showcased an observation tower, which at the time was the tallest structure in New York in addition to their own knockoff version of London's Crystal Palace, in which the fair was held. World's fairs from the 1850s to 1890 debuted inventions such as the first plastic, the first mechanical ice machine, the first elevator with a safety brake, the telegraph, the passenger locomotive, and more. Music by Giuseppe Verdi, decorative arts from William Morris, and sculpture and painting generally became a larger and larger part of the exhibitions as time went on. And with every year, more and more people attended, more nations participated, more money was made by all involved. World's fairs were a really, really big deal, of which today there is no contemporary counterpart. And now we come to the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. It was actually supposed to happen in 1892 to celebrate the anniversary of Christopher Columbus's voyage to North America, occurring 400 years previously in 1492. But even though planning had begun in earnest in 1886, by 1890 it was obvious that the Planning Commission would need another year to see their World's Fair done in the way they envisioned. And what did the Planning Commission envision? a world's fair to beat all others in size, scope, and splendor. The site chosen was Chicago's Jackson Park, which lies along the shoreline of Lake Michigan. The idea was to house the fair not in an enormous single building, like the Crystal Palace, but rather to design and construct what amounted to a small city covering 600 acres, or about two and a half square kilometers, containing over 200 buildings, many with a unified architectural scheme. The different nations involved would have their own standalone pavilions, and 46 nations contributed more than in any previous fair. And it wouldn't be simply a bunch of buildings standing in a park. No, the spaces between the buildings would be dramatically landscaped to include fountains, a lagoon, and canals, which allowed fairgoers to transverse the fair by open-air launches or by gondolas. Okay, so at this point, I really can't resist just taking a little bit of a detour in our discussion. You know, I'm talking about the 1893 Chicago World's Fair because its art and architecture would influence the city beautiful movement. So I'll certainly talk about those artists and architects and the works they produced for the fair. But first, I just need to gush over the other aspects of this incredible event. Even completely ignoring the art and architecture of the Chicago World's Fair, it was one of the most remarkable cultural events in American history that I think few people today seem to know much about. So many things happened there for the first time that have remained in American culture or even in global culture to this day. Let me just give you kind of a, a laundry list of things that happened there, and I truly hope it inspires some of you to, uh, to look into the Chicago World's Fair on your own. It's a very, very rewarding topic, and you can find all sorts of really fascinating documentaries on YouTube and whatnot. Okay, so uh, to begin with, probably the most notable um, artifact of the Chicago World's Fair was the product of engineer George Washington Ferris, who built an enormous steel structure designed to rival the Eiffel Tower, which was unveiled at the 1889 World's Fair in Paris. This enormous steel structure built by George Washington Ferris became known as Ferris's Wheel, the father of all other Ferris wheels built since. And it was absolutely enormous. Each of the wheel's passenger cars was the size of a railroad carriage, and each came equipped with a full-service bar. The Ferris wheel could hold more than 2,000 people at the same time. And for comparison, the Millennium Wheel in London can accommodate about 800, although it is taller than the original Ferris wheel. 
Now, in the six months that the fair was on, over 46 million people attended, including just about anyone famous who was alive at the time. At the fair, you could have stood in line next to heads of state, or Harry Houdini, or Helen Keller, or Henry Adams. Also, at the Chicago World's Fair, we find the first public moving walkway, you know, like you see all over in airports today. We find the first electric trains in America, the first electric dishwasher, and a host of other electrical appliances, with exhibits put out by Thomas Edison, Nikola Tesla, and George Westinghouse. Spray paint and zippers were first seen here. Juicy fruit gum, Quaker oats, cream of wheat, Aunt Jemima pancake mix, Cracker Jacks, and Pabst Blue Ribbon beer were all debuted here. Americans were also first introduced to two foreign products that have become quintessentially American, carbonated soda and hamburgers. Speaking of American quintessence, the Pledge of Allegiance was recited here for the first time. Americans were also introduced to the Hoochie Coochie Dance, which was a burlesque belly dance put on by a dancer named Little Egypt, whose pianist had written an accompaniment to go along with the dance that most Americans are still familiar with today. It's the little tune that goes, da na 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 We all know it, right? That was debuted at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. Fairgoers also saw performances put on by the likes of John Philip Sousa, Buffalo Bill Cody, Scott Joplin, Antonin Dvorak, and the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. At the fair, you could, for the very first time, go ice skating in the middle of summer in the world's first indoor ice skating rink. You could see sideshows and other amusements of the type we now associate with carnivals, which were all located down a single large boulevard in the Chicago World's Fair known as the Midway. And today, Sideshow acts and amusements at fairs are still known as Midway Amusements. The Midway at the World's Fair was a direct predecessor to all modern amusement parks, the first of which opening in 1901 at Coney Island, New York. Play a game, win a prize, go see the Hoochie Coochie Dance, gawk at the freaks on display at the Midway, eat a hamburger, you could do it all, all on the Midway. This was a World's Fair like no one had ever seen. And not only would it forever change the notion of what a fair could be, it was nothing less than a reimagining and rebranding, if not reinvention, of what America could be. Some historians mark the 1893 World's Fair as the real beginning of the American 20th century. And it all took place in a temporary city which sprang up on the shoreline of Lake Michigan, a fantastic and dreamlike place known as the White City. And we'll explore the wonders of the White City and the legacy it left to American art when the sculptor's funeral continues. Hello, just a very quick plug today for a workshop I'll be teaching this summer in the Eternal City of Rome. I will be teaching a two-week portrait modeling workshop in Rome in the last week of June and the first week of July 2017. And I'm doing it in conjunction with Rome Art Workshops. Rome Art Workshops organize fantastic and educational workshops in Rome every summer, offering a variety of courses from a variety of instructors, and this year I am pleased to say that I will be joining them. Over the course of my workshop, each student will model in clay a portrait bust from a living model, and will be using the site size method to do it. Now, site size is a technique that's normally regarded for painters or for learning how to do cast drawing, but those who practice it know that it's more than a technique for a particular medium, it's a technique for seeing. Learning to work sight size is learning to train your eye to objectively measure the world and to record your visual perception in your work. It doesn't need canons of proportion, you don't need anatomical mastery, and you're not required to measure the model with calipers, compasses, or rulers. Your eye is the measuring tool, and the more you use it, the more accurate it becomes. We'll spend half the day modeling in the studio, but the other half of the day, we're going to be out exploring what Rome has to offer. And if you are a regular listener to the podcast, you know that I won't be able to keep my mouth shut about the historical context of what we are exploring and what we're seeing. And so if you're a lover of sculpture and you've never been to Rome, there just isn't a better way to do it. Rome Art Workshops also take care of your accommodation, booking apartments with fully equipped kitchens. So if you don't feel like eating out every meal like all the tourists do, you don't have to. And in addition to everything else, you'll have plenty of time on your own to explore Rome 
Or if you really want to focus on your work, you'll have all day access to the studios to work on your projects after class hours, if that's what you want to do. It's more than a workshop, and it's more than a vacation. It's the experience of living and sculpting in Rome. Check out all the details at RomeArtWorkshops.com. So all World's Fairs were showcases of everything the various participating nations had to offer the world. But up to this point, World's Fairs really focused on industry and invention. They were a showcase for progress in technology and agriculture first and foremost. But the Chicago Fair's technological and agricultural wonders were completely overshadowed by the grounds of the fair itself, the so-called White City. And how it came about was this. Now, because the plans for the fair involved so much space and so many purpose-built yet temporary buildings to house everything, the Chicago architectural firm of Burnham and Root was put in charge of organizing all of the architecture. Daniel Burnham of Burnham and Root could have gone several ways with the architectural program. He could have built a signature piece of lasting architecture, kind of like the Crystal Palace in London's fair, and then construct more or less regular you know, sheds and temporary buildings for everything else due to the constraints of time and money. He would have received many accolades for whatever magnificent piece of architecture he himself would have designed, like Ferris did for his Ferris wheel and Eiffel did for his tower. Instead of designing a single signature piece of architecture for the fair, he saw fit to contract dozens of the best architects and scores of sculptors and designers from all over the United States. He made them stick more or less to a unified design scheme, but he also let them go absolutely crazy with their ideas. Now, the way he could do this was that the entire architecture of the fair would not be made of glass and steel or any other expensive material like the Crystal Palace was or like Eiffel's Tower. Instead, most of the fair's architecture was built out of simple, cheap materials such as wood and plaster, or to be more precise, not plaster, a material called staff. Now, staff is plaster mixed with a little cement and given a fiber reinforcement, usually straw. Now, this material would be spread over simple wood lath constructions, providing a very inexpensive but versatile material. It could be worked wet, it could be troweled on, separate pieces of decorative architecture could be cast using staff and then attached to buildings, it could be carved, and so on. It was just a very versatile and very cheap. And due to the temporary nature of the fair, its disadvantages, like its relative fragility and the fact that it wasn't waterproof, didn't really matter. It only had to last through the summer months of 1893. So before we go on any further, I really need to beg you that if you have not seen images of the White City before, you need to Google it now or check out some of the images I have at the Sculptor's Funeral website, thesculptorsfuneral.com. I absolutely will not be able to sufficiently describe the White City. It is no exaggeration to say that words cannot do it justice. If you've never seen it, well, there's just nothing to compare it to because there had never been anything like it, nor will there be again, most likely. So if you, uh, if you have some of those images in front of you now, what makes these images all the more impressive is that this magical place you're looking at no longer exists. It was built in the space of 18 months, and it was gone only a few years later. Having said all that, for those of you who are listening while driving or otherwise can't look at pictures right now, I'll do my best to give you at least an idea of what it looked like. So the first thing to know is that Daniel Burnham was a Chicago architect at a time when Chicago was really starting to develop its own native progressive style. The world's first skyscraper was actually built in Chicago. But even so, Daniel Burnham needed many more architects than Chicago alone could provide, and so he turned to the East Coast and New York to enlist the best and the brightest architects of the day. This includes, of course, Richard Morris Hunt, the first architect to be trained at the École de Beaux-Arts in Paris, and who was the author of the Washington Arch. He was the author of Trinity Church in Boston, and also the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty. Daniel Burnham's list included the firm of McKim, Mead, and White, who, like Richard Morris Hunt, were trained in Paris and were adherents of the styles of architecture promoted at the École de Beaux-Arts, which in America was coming to be known as the Beaux-Arts style. 
You may remember the name of Stanford White from previous podcasts. He was the architect who designed many of the pedestals and frames for the sculptures of his good friend, Augustus St. Gaudens. And so, even though many Chicago architects, notably Louis Sullivan and the, the young Frank Lloyd Wright, were also on this big design team, the White City was really a monument to the Beaux-Arts style. Architects each had their own stable of designers, painters, and sculptors, and so for every architect involved with the fair, there were a half dozen sculptors involved as well. Topping it all off was Frederick Law Olmsted, the designer of Central Park in Manhattan, a man considered to be the father of landscape architecture in America. Now, what is the Beaux-Arts style, at least as it was practiced by the United States? Generally, it can be called selective historical reenactment in architecture, favoring the styles of antiquity and the Renaissance over the Gothic or Romanesque. It exhibits imposing and ordered structure, projecting symmetry, rationality, and harmony, interspersed with decorative architecture and statuary, which serve to liven up the surfaces of the construction. The Capitol Building in Washington, D.C., and similar surrounding structures along the National Mall, these are all good examples of the Beaux-Arts style. But it's not a single monolithic style, either. Beaux-Arts architecture can be distinctly Greek or distinctly Roman. It could even be Egyptian. It could be influenced by the Renaissance, or it could be a mixture of any or all of the styles I mentioned. It's an elastic, eclectic, self-conscious, artificial style, it must be said. It's a pastiche of all that has gone before it in European architecture. Motivated by the desire to link the new world to the old, to demonstrate a continuity of culture from Europe to the Americas, and to demonstrate to Europe that the young United States deserved a place at the table of the world powers, economically, politically, and culturally. The White City was organized around a large central oblong basin, with other smaller water features connected to it by a series of canals and bridges, including a large lagoon. Now, surrounding the basin and connected lagoon were most of the main buildings of the fair, the buildings housing agriculture, machinery, the mines building, the electricity building, and the building of manufacturers and liberal arts. Now, this last building, the manufacturers building, when it was built, was absolutely enormous, and in fact, was the largest building in the world for the short time it existed. Together with the administration building, a music hall, and a casino, this area, comprised of the, the main buildings of the fair and the central basin, was known as the Court of Honor. And when we speak of the White City, it's really this location, inside of the larger fair, that we're really talking about. All the buildings in the Court of Honor are related to the Beaux-Arts style, but each have their own flavor at the same time. What they have in common was that they were all white, of course, they were made of mostly plaster and then painted white, but they also were designed to have the same cornice height, right? So they rose more or less to the same height. Some buildings had domes, some were more Greek than Roman, although most, I think, were probably heavily Roman-inspired. But probably the biggest historical influence on the architecture was the French Second Empire style which tended to be architecture richly decorated with columns, arches, arcades, pavilions, and also sculpture. As we look at the various images of the Court of Honor, we see the buildings and the areas around the lagoon and basin, and even inside the basin itself, absolutely festooned with sculpture in the form of fountains, freestanding statuary, and architectural decoration. Now, just as there was a single architect, Daniel Burnham, in charge of all the architecture and the architects who designed for the World's Fair, there was also a single sculptor, appointed director of sculpture, to whom all other sculptors answered. And that sculptor was Augustus St. Gaudens, arguably the, arguably the most prominent sculptor in America, and, like the major architects of the fair, trained in France and a practitioner of the Beaux-Arts style. Augustus St. Gaudens is often quoted as having said that the gathering of artists and architects for the 1893 World's Fair was the greatest meeting of artistic minds since the Renaissance. Well, that's easily debatable. But it is certain that no comparable collection of artists will be found in the history of the United States. Every sculptor who could find his way to Chicago was involved, 
If you knew how to model in clay and cast in plaster, and you lived in the United States, you could have found work at the World's Fair. It was here at the World's Fair that many sculptors' assistants and apprentices came into their own as artists. A notable example of this is Augusta St. Gowden's own chief assistant, the young Frederick McMoneys. In truth, McMoneys was already a sculptor in his own right, having completed his famous statue of Nathan Hale the year previously, as well as the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Arch in New York. Like all sculptors working on the fair, McMoneys had his hand in a number of works, but his masterpiece of the fair was a fountain which dominated one end of the long lagoon of the Court of Honor called the Columbia Fountain, but informally known at the fair as the McMoney's Fountain. It's a huge, whimsical sculpture of a fantastical ship, like something out of a fairy tale or romantic legend. The ship was called the Barge of State. Now, sitting enthroned atop the Barge of State is the figure of Columbia, the allegorical representation of the United States. And there are a dozen more allegorical figures manning this ship, this barge of state. The barge is guided by fame, it's steered by time, and it is powered by ten rowers, each of whom represent various arts and industries. In addition to this allegorical crew, the barge of state was also pulled by seahorses, meant to represent commerce. This overblown and outsized sculpture sat in a circular basin 150 feet in diameter, and was further populated by other seahorses and tritons and mermaids and so on. It was, for the duration of the fair, the largest fountain in the world. When you look at the pictures of this barge of state, which I have on the website, keep in mind that each figure on this boat is close to the scale of Michelangelo's David, or three times life-size. But that's the thing when working with a material like staff, which is cheap and lightweight. You can go as large a scale as you like. A case in point would be the central statue at the other end of the Long Lagoon. In the center of the rounded end of the lagoon arose a large pedestal, simple in form, but its proportions very similar to the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty in New York. And on this pedestal, too, we find a colossal allegorical statue, and its name was the Statue of the Republic. It stood 65 feet, or 20 meters tall, about two-thirds the scale of the Statue of Liberty, and it was gilt, or at least painted with gold paint. This colossal was modeled by the sculptor Daniel Chester French, who had made waves in the 1870s with his sculpture known as the Minuteman in Concord, Massachusetts. Daniel Chester French would go on to even greater fame as the sculptor of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., and would be recognized as one of the greatest of American sculptors, on a level with Augustus St. Gaudens. But, judging by the Statue of the Republic for the fair, it's difficult to imagine French's future reputation. It has to be said that the Statue of the Republic is a pretty mediocre statue. It's true the immense scale of the work, coupled with a budget he could not exceed, plus having to complete the sculpture in a matter of months rather than years, all contributed to its weaknesses and awkwardness. But I am sure that this 65-foot gilt statue was impressive, at least from a distance. These enormous sculptural works, bookending the basin of the Court of Honor by French and McMoneys, were the cornerstones of the sculptural program for the fair. But the Court of Honor was absolutely littered with smaller statues. And when I say smaller, I mean maybe only twice life-size rather than three times life-size, or 60 feet tall. There was an animal motif dispersed throughout the fairgrounds, displaying animals native to America wherever and whenever it was felt necessary to place a sculpture, on the pedestals and balustrades of bridges, walkways, stairways, or any otherwise bare space which could use a little decor. These countless bears and moose, antelope, jaguars, elks, and buffaloes were all modeled by Edward Kemys and Femister Proctor, names I imagine that are unfamiliar to most listeners. Each large building of the fair had also architectural sculpture, as I mentioned, and it's well worth taking a look at some of the images of those just to see both the quality and the scale these lesser-known sculptors achieved. Few American and almost no foreign sculptors know names like Philip Martini, Larkin Mead, Herman Atkins McNeil, Richard Bach, Edward C. Potter, Carl Smith, John J. Boyle, Henry Bearer, or Alice Rideau. Some other names are maybe a little bit more familiar, 
Olin Levi Warner, Femister Proctor, Frederick Ruxtell, Carl Bitter, James Earl Fraser, and Laredo Taft. But the 1893 fair gave all of these sculptors a platform for their work to be viewed by the world, and several sculptors' masterpieces indeed were made for the World's Fair in, unfortunately, impermanent materials. And many of these sculptors went on to very active careers, precisely due to the World's Fair. Up until this point, the Beaux-Arts style had been primarily a New York or a New England phenomenon, but when millions of Americans came to the fair from all corners of the nation, they returned home with a newfound interest and enthusiasm for the Beaux-Arts style, and the Beaux-Arts idiom of architecture and public sculpture dominated in the United States until well after the end of the First World War. This is what came to be the official style of the City Beautiful movement, and it's the closest thing to a national official aesthetic the United States ever had. The results of the City Beautiful movement are still with us all over the United States. The idea of a civic center, the common occurrence in towns across America of the clustering of civic buildings, like town halls, post offices, courthouses, and libraries, all in close proximity to each other, and with a related architectural theme and perhaps a town square or public park in the center of these buildings, that design that we see repeated again and again all over the United States, in cities large and small, is a direct descendant of the buildings of the Court of Honor, centered around the basin at the Chicago World's Fair. The greatest expression of this idea of a civic center in a city, as well as the greatest expression of the City Beautiful movement, we find in the National Mall in Washington, D.C. The city of the District of Columbia, or Washington, D.C., was a planned city from the beginning, and the urban planning had been initially designed by the architect Pierre L'Enfant in 1791, which included, among other things, the layout of the streets and the placement of the executive mansion, known to us as the White House, and of the Capitol building. L'Enfant envisioned also a large boulevard extending from the capital, similar in concept to the grand avenues of Paris or Versailles. L'Enfant's plan was only partially realized, however, and when the issue of completing the city planning was brought up in conjunction with Washington, D.C.'s centennial celebration, a commission was formed to revisit, adjust, and complete L'Enfant's plan. This commission developed what is known as the Macmillan Plan, named after the senator who sponsored it. And this commission, this special group of architects and planners, was comprised entirely out of alumni of the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. Daniel Burnham, director of construction of the fair. Architect Charles McKim of the architectural firm McKim, Mead & White. Sculptor Augustus St. Gaudens and landscape architect Frederick Olmsted. The Macmillan Plan is responsible for the National Mall as we today know it. L'Enfant's Boulevard had been capped off by the obelisk of the Washington Monument, which created the mall, but the mall itself was a mishmash of meandering paths and encroaching buildings and even a railroad track that cut right across the space. The Macmillan Commission restored the mall to the green space we find it today, and the assorted courts, governmental buildings, monuments, cultural institutions, and museums which line the sides of the National Mall all suggest elements of the White City's Court of Honor. But the strongest aftertaste of the World's Fair comes in the form of the reflecting pool between the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Monument, as well as the adjacent tidal basin and memorial bridge which leads to the Arlington National Cemetery. It's the closest thing we have to the preservation of the scale and the aesthetic of the White City. The entire project took 20 years to complete, thanks in part to World War I, and was brought to a close with the erection of the Lincoln Memorial in 1922. The aesthetics and design of the National Mall were copied countless times over the next few decades all over the country, although, of course, on a much more humble scale. Some of these Beaux-Arts civic centers are still intact, some plans were never fully realized, and some have been modified beyond recognition. But in hundreds of large and medium-sized cities in the United States, you can find examples of the Beaux-Arts style inherent in the City Beautiful movement, even if it's in the architecture of a single building rather than a town center. And these buildings usually are some of the most interesting and some of the buildings most beloved by the people who live there. My own hometown of Jackson, Michigan, still has the Beaux-Arts-style public library, 
built in 1906, made possible by a grant from the philanthropist Andrew Carnegie, who financed the building of thousands of libraries around the world, many of them done in the Beaux-Arts style. The Beaux-Arts style can also be seen in my old post office back in Jackson, built in the 1930s. It's still around, but it's now part of the headquarters for the local power company. It has to be said that the City Beautiful movement never lived up to its societal goals, those of instilling moral virtue in the hearts of the citizenry through the projection of order, harmony, and beauty. More often than not, in fact, the planning of civic centers had the effect of removing slums and other bad parts of town to the outskirts around the center, or otherwise effectively creating economic exclusionary zones. The poor and the downtrodden were not lifted up by the architecture so much as they were squeezed out by it, and made more invisible to the rest of society. The City Beautiful movement as an aesthetic has its detractors as well. The architect Louis Sullivan claimed that the 1893 Chicago World's Fair and its White City set American architecture back 40 years, that the Beaux-Arts style was a pastiche of the old and tired tropes of European architecture, a naked ploy to dress the new world in the mantle of old-world respectability, an attempt that was an imitation rather than emulation. And you know, I totally agree with Louis Sullivan on those points. The Beaux-Arts style probably did set a more truly American architecture back by 40 years, and thank goodness it did. By doing so, the City Beautiful movement prevented an unknown number of anonymous steel and glass skyscrapers and unadorned box-like structures from being built. And later, in the 20th century, these Beaux-Arts buildings provided young people growing up in small Midwestern towns, myself included, an opportunity to experience and be captivated by a quality and a craftsmanship, an aesthetic of architecture that was not to be found anywhere else in town. As a 10-year-old, I would walk to my town's Carnegie Library as often as I could. I spent days and whole summers there, and I clearly recall a particular feeling every time I walked in between the imposing limestone columns flanking the main entrance. Ten-year-old me felt like I was walking into a, an important place a significant place. And that made me feel important. It made me feel like, by using the library, I was doing an important thing. And I was. Well, thanks again for listening, everyone. Um, I know there wasn't really a lot of specific talk about sculpture in this episode, but the City Beautiful Movement and the 1893 World's Fair... Uh, sets the stage for several decades of American sculpture to come, so it had to be done. So don't forget to check out uh, our additional content at the Sculptor's Funeral YouTube channel or on our Facebook group page as well. And while you're there, you can join in the conversation at the Facebook page. You can also subscribe to the podcast at Stitcher Mobile or iTunes or wherever you get your podcast and receive the podcast downloaded automatically to your PC, tablet, or mobile device whenever a new episode airs. And if you want to help the podcast reach other people like you, leave a review of the podcast or give the podcast a rating at iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you subscribe. Also, check out thesculptorsfuneral.com. It's our website where you can stream the complete archives of the show. You can check out the image galleries for this and every episode. You can find out about upcoming workshops. And it's where you can pick up a Sculptor's Funeral mug or throw pillow. And finally, if you need to stock your studio with supplies and materials, click on the sponsor of the podcast, Blick Art Supplies, at thesculptorsfuneral.com. Clicking on the link you see at the podcast and then buying from Blick helps to support the podcast, and for that, I thank you. Thanks again for listening, and have a productive week.